These days, it seems almost everything comes with a warning label, from food packaging to tools to toys, and from grocery store plastic bags, do not put this over your head, to hair dryers, do not immerse in water. It's as though manufacturers must imagine even nonsensical ways in which their products could be potentially misused and then warn against them. And yet one of the things that we humans misuse daily and dangerously comes with no warning label at all, our tongues. The writer of Proverbs recognizes the potential for their misuse. Rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. While the psalmist writes, set a guard over my mouth, O Lord, Keep watch over the door of my lips. But why the concern? The tongue is just a fleshy pink muscle, singularly unimpressive to look at, and words are just noisy puffs of air. What is it about them that is worthy of a prayer for divine oversight? Well, as I pondered the question in response to our scripture lessons for this morning, my thoughts turned to a Caldecott award-winning children's book that I read years ago. The best wisdom is often found in children's books. And this one is a modern-day fable by Leo Leone entitled Frederick. Frederick is a field mouse who shares a burrow with a family of mice. And as the fable begins... Summer is giving way to the golden days of autumn, and the mice are working hard to gather greens and seeds and thistles and berries to lay up for the lean months ahead. Rather, most of the mice are hard at work. Frederick is sitting in the sunshine by himself. Frederick, come and help us gather food for the winter ahead, say the other mice. But Frederick doesn't move. I'm gathering sunshine for the cold winter days, he responds. Later, as they continue to labor, scurrying after seeds, Frederick sits staring at the meadow. And now, Frederick, the mice ask, I gather colors, for winter is cold and gray, he replies. Yet again, the mice come upon Frederick, and he seems half asleep. Are you dreaming, Frederick? They ask reproachfully. Oh no, I'm gathering words, for the winter days are long and many, and we will run out of things to say, responds Frederick, a worker only in his thoughts. And at last, the time comes to seal the burrow, and the mice snuggle away inside, ready for the hard months ahead. And at first in the burrow, it is quite warm and pleasant, and the mice are cozy, and there is plentiful food for many days. But then the depths of winter come, and no matter what the mice do, the burrow is never quite warm, as the cold dampness brings a shiver to the spine and a chattering to the teeth. And the gathered food supplies begin to dwindle, and the straw is gone, and the life in the burrow begins to creep in its petty pace from day to day. And at this point in the story, we might expect a grasshopper and the ants type of moral. If only Frederick had worked instead of dreaming the summer away, there might be a bit more food or more security for all. Or if you don't work, you don't eat, something like that. Instead, the story takes a wonderfully unexpected turn. In the grim grayness of the burrow, Frederick begins to speak of creation's colors that are now only a distant memory, the colors that he has gathered. And he tells of the sky's rich blue and the sun's gaudy gold and the emerald green of the grass and the forest green of the leaves. And as he weaves a tapestry of red geraniums and blue delphiniums of ambers and umbers and lush, lovely lavenders, the other mice imagine his words and the unbearable grayness of the burrow is somehow transformed. 
And as Frederick continues to tell a tale of bird songs and babbling brooks or wind whispers and rain patters, the stifling silence is also transformed. Frederick, it turns out, has brought something into the burrow after all. By his words, chosen artfully and spoken carefully, he has changed it completely. Now the actual moral of the story might be there are many ways to be useful, but I would point us to a different lesson this morning. The lesson I would have us to see as Frederick transforms the burrow is that words have the power to shape worlds. I'll say that once more because it's a central understanding from our scripture lesson for this morning. Words shape worlds. And that's why it's said the pen is mightier than the sword. And it's why a stirring speech can send an army to battle or a sports team to victory. Words shape worlds. And thus we can understand negative poisonous words can create negative poisonous worlds. The acclaimed poet and spiritual writer Kathleen Norris shares her experience of this truth in an autobiographical account. As a child in a military family, Norris moved around a lot. In the seventh grade, she relocated along with her family to Hawaii, becoming the new girl in a school where most of the other kids had been together since kindergarten. She felt terribly awkward. She describes herself as slightly chubby, a bit buck-toothed, a mainlander who knew nothing about the island world. Nevertheless, she made the best of things, and by mid-afternoon of her first day, she thought things were going okay. As she was sitting in a bathroom stall, however, she heard several girls enter the bathroom unaware of her presence. And from her stall, she had the opportunity to do what many of us have unwisely wished, to hear what others say about us when we are not around. Chatting freely, the girls made fun of her hair, her weight, her clothes, her voice, and her manner until one of them noticed her shoes beneath the stall door. Oh my God, she's in here, one of the voices cried. And the faceless girls made a hasty exit. Now you've heard the phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It's not true. If it were true, why would Norris write of the pain of being made an outsider even 30 years later as an adult? She can press that scar and it still hurts. Words shape worlds. And of course, Kathleen Norris's experience is but one relatively minor example of the damage that words can do because honestly, anyone who has made it through middle school knows that unkind words can wound. But think of a child who is told again and again, you can't, or you're not smart enough, or you'll never amount to anything. By those words, a child is woven a world of hurt and of fear and of limitation and of failure. And if no antidote to that poison is administered, words shape worlds. Or imagine a marriage without I love you's or I need you's or I'm sorry's. I once had a friend who jokingly told his wife, I told you I loved you when I married you, and I'll let you know if it changes. <laughs> but I love you's should be stored up richly like warm words for a cold winter. 
in our family, it's a practice that every phone call ends with I love you. Every departure is accompanied by I love you, be careful. And often, when sitting in the room together, a gratuitous I love you gets tossed out for good measure. It is so much a force of habit that it can produce some interesting reactions. I was once finishing a phone call with Amy as I was simultaneously competing completing a transaction at the auto dealership. And I was calling out my thanks to the workers while ringing off with Amy, which resulted in my calling across the garage, thanks, I love you, <laughs> to a group of surprised mechanics. But shouldn't we dream of a world where every spouse and every auto mechanic know just how much they are loved? Words shape worlds. Words, you see, shape perceptions, and perceptions inform opinions, and opinions guide actions, and actions elicit reactions, and reactions create realities. If you want to consider the poisonous power of words, think of the as yet incomplete inventory of damages created by Russia's Facebook troll farms. Just words shared again and again and again until they become truth and truth is shared and falsehood is made real. What do I share? What do I say? What does it shape? The psalmist's prayer is a good one. Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips or the typings of my fingers. And now I'll introduce a thought that occurred to me only recently. If we're willing to consider the power of our words to shape things outwardly, might we also imagine their potential to impact us inwardly? If I casually traffic in angry words, is there not an inward residue of anger that lingers long after the words are spent? If I'm quick to voice my criticism, do I imagine that that will make my spirit more generous? My words shape my outward and my inward reality, and it might be helpful to think of our tongues as having two ends. So now we begin to see why the writer of James offers such caution about the tongue. A bit is small, but it guides a horse, James cautions. And a rudder is small, but it sets the direction of a mighty ship. So also the tongue is a small member, but it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. So now the simple spiritual question becomes, if words shape worlds, and if the tongue is a fire capable of setting entire forests ablaze, then am I in the business of arson or casual carelessness or actual fire prevention? I find myself in a setting at work where my coworkers are criticizing someone. Not the sort of honest critique that could be helpfully voiced if the person were present, but more like character assassinating gossip. She's just so pushy. And in the South, where I come from, it might be followed up with, bless her heart. By the way, bless her heart excuses nothing. What is said is said, and it's not the heart part that gets remembered. But in any event, I hear such a criticism of a fictitious, pushy co-worker. Do I join an agreement and give the criticism a life of its own? Or do I ignore it, complicit in my silence, or do I respond to it and redirect it? Well, I agree that she can be headstrong at times, but you'll never meet a harder worker who cares more about her job. 
choice as small as that can spread a fire or extinguish it. My choice. My tongue. Or imagine that someone has hurt me deeply. I can use my words to hurt back, to go for the jugular, to cut to the bone. I have that power. Or I can perhaps at some cost seek to speak words of healing. What you have done has hurt me. And I'm upset and it isn't okay. But I want to work this through with you somehow. Because our relationship matters to me. And as soon as those words are spoken, a new world of forgiveness is made possible, not yet fully realized, but tentatively spoken into being. My choice, my tongue. Such is the power of words. Now with that said, we're desperately casual about the ways that we use our tongues. We make so many excuses, like the excuse of the private conversation. I'm only saying this to you. I'm not speaking publicly, so it's all right. I'm only saying it to you and to two or three trusted friends. It won't set a forest ablaze. It's only a cigarette. Or the old political candidate ploy. I was going to take the high road, but you took the argument into the mud, so now you're responsible for what I say. As if someone else can genuinely take control of my tongue. We let ourselves off the hook in a thousand different ways, but the writer of James sees it differently. And this is not merely like the old saying, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything. James makes our speech a matter of faith. With our tongues, the writer says, we bless God and then we speak ill of our neighbor who is made in the likeness of God. And that, the writer of James would have us realize, is as unacceptable as using our good toothbrush to scrub the grout in the shower. That which should be kept clean is defiled, and that's not okay. Our words about each other and to each other matter to God. Fresh and salt water cannot flow from the same spring. If salty words flow from our tongues, words of hurt or harsh criticism or gossip, we are not to excuse them. We are to repent of them, period. Scripture leaves us no wiggle room. And that, I suppose, is nearly enough to leave us in despair. After all, our scripture lesson also says no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and a deadly poison. No matter how hard I try, probably daily, I will falter and I will fail and I will speak words that do not glorify God or edify my neighbor. In anger or carelessness, I will speak into being words and worlds that outright oppose God's will. So what am I to do? Well, like the psalmist, I can pray God's guard upon my mouth. And as often as I fail, I can genuinely repent. And as often as I offend, I can apologize. And as often as I hurt, I can seek healing. And beyond these things, I think there is a lesson in this morning's fable, Frederick. A lesson that speaks of the importance of what we are doing here today. In our worship and our education here at Grace, in our shared life each week, we gather something. Something that colors our lives. 
And as we sit here and worship, we gather grace and we stockpile gratitude so that in the lean, cold times that may come in the week ahead, when pressures rise and tension comes, we can speak words of grace and speak new worlds into being. As we come together, we gather a sense of the presence of God so that when we come to the relationship in our week that tests us the most, God is present there also. As we enter God's presence, we gather forgiveness and self-worth so that in the struggles of life, we carry forgiveness and worth to those we meet. In short, we gather colors and when the time comes, we endeavor with our tongues to speak rainbows. And as we do so, more and more, day by day, we set God's guard upon our tongues. Though we surely are unable to tame our tongues, just as surely God is able. Speak only the truth and always in love. Amen.